Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Michael Jansen at the uh, Center for Spine and Orthopedics in Denver, Colorado. Um, I have been a spine surgeon here in the North Denver geographic area for about 25 years. Um, and this afternoon I wanted to discuss with you um, degenerative spondylolisthesis and when would you approach this from an anterior approach, which is through the abdomen. Degenerative spondylolisthesis is a degenerative condition where one vertebrae essentially translates off the other vertebrae or anterior and can compress the cauda, quina, or the nerves at that level. You may have seen one of your family physicians or an expert in your community and diagnosed with these. You may have read an MRI report that your family physician ordered um, and um, uh, ordered and uh, um, then uh, diagnosed you with degenerative spondylolisthesis, giving you a little bit of a confusion on what that means. So I'd like to try to go through that and specifically talk about not the natural history, but how we manage that from an anterior approach, specifically um, at the Center for Spine and Orthopedics in Denver. So when do we do an anterior approach? Sometimes we do an anterior approach, that means through the abdomen. That means we're operating anterior to the spinal nerves, anterior to the cauda equina, which is the spinal nerves in the low back, and compared to doing a posterior surgery. We tend to do that when a patient has axial back pain, that means they have back pain because the disc is deteriorated and worn out or sometimes when they just have a combination of nerve pain. Now here's the pathology. You can see this cadaveric specimen and you can see the disc there and we put a circle around where the nerve is with the arrow pointing to the nerve. And sometimes what happens in a degenerative spondylolisthesis is that nerve gets compressed. It gets compressed because the facet joints in the back, kind of like the tie rods on your car, get loose and start moving. That creates shear forces to the disc, and then over time the disc deteriorates, and then as we develop this spondylolisthesis, meaning anterior translation of the spine. Now, sometimes we just need to do a decompression. I listed there that there's two ways to do a decompression. You can do a direct decompression where the surgeon surgically goes in and takes the pressure off the nerve. The other alternative is to do an indirect decompression where the surgeon goes in and realigns the spine, which indirectly takes the pressure off the nerve. Let's talk a little bit about that. Here's an example of an x-ray showing an uh, alignment. This is an x-ray from the front to the back of the spine. And one vertebrae is shifted off the other, kind of like the leaning tower of Pisa. But when it does that, it takes the nerve with it. That causes many times patients who have severe unrelenting nerve pain. In this case, if a surgeon goes in and only frees up the nerve, more likely than not, he will create instability. So it's like a tree that's leaning over. And you go in and cut a little bit of the tree out at the bottom, now the whole construct's unstable. So the instability caused the compression of the nerve. In this case, probably realigning the spine is gonna be essential. Here's another example on these two specimens. You see the red on the right picture around the circle is a bone spur. So the body has reacted by laying down calcium, causing a spur in a lessened ideal area, which now is irritating the nerve, causing neuropathic pain. Sometimes just taking that spur away may be all the patient needs to get a good clinical improvement. How about the facets in the back of the spine? The spine is like a tripod. The disc is in the front, the two facet joints in the back. So the direction of the facet joints are like shingles on a roof. That's what we call orientation. They can create stability to the spine. And as you take a look here, the bottom picture shows the beautiful white, which is the cartilage next to the bone. And the orientations on the two pictures up above are the direction of the facet joints. If you're born with facet joints that are more sidely oriented, we call that sagittal oriented, then it has a much higher chance of translating, causing degenerative spondylolisthesis. It occurs in different stages. Here's an example of, on the left, is a picture of a normal looking facet joint, and on the right, the relationship of the nerve and the thick ligaments, and that's an early stage of some changes in the joint. And the disc is important. Here you can see the disc in this illustration, in this little cartoon illustration, is holding the spine up with the muscles pulling back, the facet joints trying to line up, and so it's a combination of the disc, the facet joint, the orientation, the cartilage, and the muscle all giving stability. 
One of the other key things that's important is what's the quality of the bone. That means do we have a patient that's got bad osteoporosis and, or maybe a long-term smoking history that has changed their overall host? And each of those go into a decision that as a clinician with experience in this, we try to make the best decision for each patient. Here's an example of a slightly overweight female on the operating table. You can see the MRI scan in the lower left demonstrating that one vertebrae has translated forward off of the other vertebrae. That's called degenerative spondylolisthesis, and that results in spinal stenosis. Well, the patient had, this patient had a fusion. This is a bone in the space, a little metal artifact in the front is some sort of fixation device. It's given stability with those screws, and you can see how this created stability on an unstable segment and that was done through the front and this is a CAT scan and the CAT scan clearly shows the body grew the bone in. When the surgeon does this operation or at the Center for Spine and Orthopedics when we do a surgery like this, at the time of surgery the patients think they had a fusion. The fusion is what occurs over four to six months or nine months. We did the operation to allow the fusion the best chance of it growing together, but it has a lot to do with the patient's biology, the techniques that the surgeon used, the stability, the health of the patient, nutrition of the patient gives the most amount of stability. It also has the thought to do with what is the physical demands of the patient. We think that if we're going to do an anterior surgery, which sometimes is less morbid and less recovery, it is to give a patient a painful anterior accessible disc. That's the key. And we got to pick the right patient. Patients we can get anterior access to are patients that are challenged with weight and been struggling with weight for many, many years. Maybe either some weight loss or bariatric surgery may be more beneficial to them before to decrease the risk of spine surgery. What we used to do when we did these anterior surgeries is to make these large incisions in the patient's abdomen and mobilize the vessels. And we've evolved from appendectomies to open surgeries to open spine surgery like this to a much smaller approach where we can now access the spine and do most of these types of surgeries with a very small incision you can see there that may be less than one or two inches to actually get us the access to that of the patient's spine. That comes from experience, it comes from an evolution of technology for us to really understand that. And we also do many times do these fancy tests ahead of time to really understand where the patient's anatomy is, so where their aorta is, their vena cava, what the best role of these patients are because inside this patient they're all a little different. Each of us have a unique uh, anatomy to our vascular and nerve supply in the front. And it's important that your surgeons have the experience to understand what that is so that they can give you the best surgical treatment at the right phase of their disease. So which of these patients do we think is best for this type of technology? The surgeon has to first really understand the pathology that your patient is suffering from. Is it degenerative disc disease? Is it degenerative spondylolisthesis? Is it spinal stenosis? Is it scoliosis? Or is it a combination of all of them? And does a patient need a direct or an indirect decompression? Does a patient have severe back pain that they need a fusion or a disc replacement? Or does a patient have what you've seen there called neurogenic claudication, where the patient can only walk so far and they have terrible leg pain, or they use a shopping cart at the grocery store because they have this terrible nerve pain and sometimes that can help. We think the best patients at the Center for Spine Orthopedics in Denver are patients that have stability in the back that have a painful anterior accessible disc, that have good bone quality, and that has the ability for us to access their spine with less downside of doing it from the front typically than the back. And here's a classic example. We tend to make an incision that allows ourselves and our surgical team to be able to access the spine to reconstruct it in a meticulous fashion. Here's an example of a marker in the disc space. We've evacuated a very worn out disc in a patient. Uh, we've been able to come in from the side in this case. An X lift means that the patient we access through their side. So we don't manage every patient the same. Each patient is tailored to try to find the right treatment for the right patient at the right phase of their disease. Here coming in from the side, we were able to balance out the spine, level it, place in a spacer, and stabilize it without going through their abdomen, we came in through the side to fix this particular problem at that phase of their disease and was able to give them a fusion. Here you can see there's a normal curvature now. We've created lordosis. 
We've stabilized the segment. We've created the environment for this to heal and to subsequently fuse. So which of these do we do? A big exposure, a small exposure, an implant that fuses, an implant that stabilizes. It all is picking the right patient at the right phase of their disease and picking the patient that we clearly think that the pain that they're suffering from matches all the radiographic findings. And it's a balance. And I think it's a puzzle of getting a fusion, getting a realignment, finding the right biology for the patient, trying to make sure they're not smoking or are taking other medications that would inhibit a good outcome, and what do they need to do a decompression. Because it's more complex. And having surgeons that have a lot of experience and understanding the complexity of this is going to help the patient, their family members, get the maximum amount of benefit from this thing that's setting them back, degenerative disc disease, to get on with the phase of their life that they need. Not all patients are the same. Some of them need a fusion from the back, the front. Some may benefit with a decompression. Some of these patients benefit with a disc replacement technology. But the key is really finding the right phase of the, right, uh, of the patient's disease and getting, matching it with the right technology. And our team at the Center for Spine and Orthopedics are honored to see patients and give surgical opinions and non-surgical opinions from patients from around the globe for the last 25 years. Thank you.